work on this. I mean, it's 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 really groundbreaking, as we all know. Um, I, I say that I, I with all the work that has been done, the work is really just going to be beginning uh, to to make this uh, real and to understand the impact it's going to have on everybody involved in the system. I, I at some point in the later today, I will just remind the committee that in looking at how far we've come with this particular um, proposal, this, this approach to uh, youthful offenders, um, we've got to remember that it still has to fit within uh, the context of a, of a juvenile system that is being uh, impacted not only in the chin's docket with filings, but also the increase in youthful offender. And for as much uh, success as we've had in bringing people together with this concept of 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds coming in, I think in a lot of respects, uh, the work is really just beginning to understand what we have, uh, what, what we're doing and what we're trying to do. So I look forward to the, uh, to the challenge. Um, but it, it certainly will be one. Right. And again, my name is Lael Chester. I am the director of the Emerging Adult Justice Project at Columbia University Justice Lab. And um, I've been leading this sort of project now for an, a few years. And um, this is a burgeoning field. This is not something I've been in this field for, for decades. And I didn't know Emerging Adult Justice wasn't on anyone's radar. Um, and. Um, and so we work with jurisdictions from around the country and we've been able to observe and help and do research on different approaches and it's really all a matter of public safety, right? If you can increase uh, positive outcomes for young people, um, we all benefit. They certainly young people, their families and communities, but we all benefit and we also can reduce costs. Um, so it's really been a total pleasure to work with Vermont in the last year, um, a very, very thoughtful process. Um, but I'm going to kick it off to Karen so she can describe what we were, the absolute focus of this research project was, and sort of the key components that went into the report. Okay. So I think we'll go to the second slide. Um, and this is just an overview of where we're going to go today. Um, and just a reminder to kind of see the committee in, in the work that's ahead is that um, DCF is required to submit a report. Um, and I believe we have some extra copies for anybody who needs one. Um, but we were required to submit a report on November 1st um, to um, explain how we would um, implement Act 201, which is the um, legislation that raised the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to include 18-year-olds. Um, and then 19 year olds starting on July 1st, 2020 and uh, July 1st, 2022 respectively. So on the next slide, this is just to give you an idea of where we're going. And um, for those of you who've had a chance to read the executive summary or sections or all of the report, it's a long report. Um, um, but uh, what you'll see here on the slide three is this is basically uh, tra tracking almost um, uh, exactly to the report We'll walk you through the impact of Raise the Age. Um, uh, we'll talk about all the strategies that we have dug into um, um, uh, and the recommendations that ensued um, regarding diversion, maximizing court efficiencies, um, close merits options, physical custody, victims' rights. Um, we'll talk about an operational plan, which I know was something that um, Representative Pew, we spent a lot of time talking about this when the legislation was still being debated in the House, um, was thinking about how um, uh, DCF would absorb the caseload and what plan would need to be in place to ensure that um, we are taking into account um, the dual roles of the Family Services Division with respect to child protection and um, supervising youth have been adjudicated the language. Um, we also have some statutory changes and data. So that's sort of an overview. And then um, just so you all have some background on the, um, the work that went into preparing this report on slide four, um, what you'll see here is that um, uh, we are so lucky um, to have um, uh, retired uh, Judge Davenport um, very much involved with um, the Children and Family Council for Prevention Program, and that she's, you know, still very active as um, as a as a as an advocate for juvenile justice reform in our state. And uh, we 
were able to contract with her um, last summer or fall to start this process by um, diving into the court data. Um, so uh, Lael will walk you through some of the data that um, the Shadow Court um, um, helped us to put together and analyze. Um, and that was really essential for us to get our hands around what juvenile delinquency numbers look like as well as the number of 18 year olds who were going through um, uh, uh, the, uh, the adult division um, uh, court. Um, so we also had the um, benefit of being able to repurpose one of our district directors for a period of time to assist us in this project and she conducted um, 12 community district meetings around the state and this was to not only um, explain to people what was going on but also to hear from our partners what their reactions were and um, any recommendations that they wanted to make and any gaps that they were concerned about and so those all helped to inform um, the work of, um, of this project. And then last fall, um, we um, issued an um, RFP, and um, Columbia, University, Columbia University Justice Lab was our was the organization that we selected to help us with um, uh, mapping out strategies. And, um, and they obviously put in a very strong proposal, but uh, we really appreciated a number of things that um, I think you will get a chance to hear about throughout the report, including their approach to um, working with states um, and, uh, and uh, jurisdictions of using action research methodology, which I think we as Vermonters can really appreciate that we want to include everybody in our decision making and recommendations. And I, I think that they did a nice job of being very inclusive and very um, um, transparent in, in our conversations and work. And then I think, you know, um, Ken touched on this, but we couldn't have done this work um, or even have gotten this far if it weren't for um, the members of the juvenile justice stakeholder group, um, which includes the judiciary, um, state's attorney and sheriff's department, the office of the defender general, mm -hmm. attorney general's office, victim advocates, the department of corrections, and of course, DCF. And this group has been great um, in that even though we don't always agree and we sometimes have some very energized um, and robust conversations, um, the goal with this group has always been to try to find common ground and to ensure that um, there are no statutory prohibitions or barriers from us being able to um, get this good work done that um, the legislature has set forth for us. So that's been um, great and they were involved with the recommendations in this report that are system related and so they um, supported um, the recommendations that we're going to walk you through that are related to the system and then finally um, DCF leadership and um, um, with the help of the Justice Lab and some of our national partners we've had a number of opportunities to do some off-site learning opportunities and um, uh, in uh, late September um, we actually um, had a conference at the law school that was um, sponsored in part by the law school and then also by the Children and Family um, Council for Prevention Program. And um, at this conference included 24 judges, um, state attorneys, um, you know, pretty much representatives across the entire spectrum of our stakeholders as well as um, uh, community providers for diversion programs in the field. And um, what's important to note about that conference is that um, we were able to get a lot of feedback and input that also helped to inform the report. So to the extent that we've been able to, um, the goal has always been to cast as wide a net as possible to both inform people about the work and then also to ensure that people's voices and um, concerns as well as recommendations and hopes for this change would be able to be incorporated in the report. So we've done our we've done our best to be um, as inclusive as we possibly could be. Okay. Um, and so from here, I'll hand it to you, Lael, on um, uh, um, background on emerging adults. Sure. So it was interesting. It was in the about 2000s that <clears throat> you know the there was a lot of money pumped into research um, on on children. And the question was, are children different than adults? And if they are, how is that relevant in the justice system? And this was after the 90s of sort of super predator era. Some of you may remember, you know, you do the crime, you, you do the time, it's, and 
Um, and it was interesting because the, the research came out with yes, the answers were yes and yes. yes. Children are not many adults, they're inherently different. And that is relevant in terms of the justice system. That's why we have a separate justice system. That's why you have a family court and a family division. That's why you have DCF that works with youth charged with crime. But one of the things that came out was that a lot of this research happened in universities. And they were trying to compare. They have a, have a contrast group, right? They have children and then they have adults. And uh, college students are sort of cheap uh, <laughs> for researchers, right? So they had children, then they had college students, and then they had you know people in 30 and beyond. And what they didn't realize when they started to analyze the data was, wait a minute, the 18 to 25 year olds look a lot like the younger peers. Um, uh, and they're really quite inherently different from the 30 plus year olds. Uh, whoops. Uh, it turns out that that 18 to 25 year old is actually a distinct developmental group. Um, and it was sort of interesting. I mean, I don't think they weren't looking for it, but they started to get the numbers and, and they were somewhat shocked. And so that means that they're like their younger peers, they're risk takers, they're thrill seekers, they're impulsive, they're influenced by their peers. That's both the negative influence, but also positive influence. When kids go off to college and it's, you know, they're in a pro social setting they often flourish, right? That's being influenced by your peers. And that many of the things like not being able to think through the consequences of an action, which makes parents ask, what were you thinking? When you have a bright person who does a really dumb thing, can actually be very much more pronounced if you have a history of trauma or any kind of brain injury. And that's why you see so many youth who have been abused and neglected and had sort of traumatic histories end up in our juvenile justice systems, right? And it is going to take them longer to, to sort of develop the maturity. Um, now, that's the difference between what we call hot cognition and cold cognition. They're, young people are super bright, right? They can do extremely well in school. They can think through who they want to vote for. All those things in a, in a kind of a nice, quiet setting, they're great. You know, they're all in. They're probably better than any of us as we get older. But their hot cognition takes a lot longer to mature. And that's what makes them impulsive and unable to sort of think through, especially when they're with their peers. What's interesting is while you have sort of developmental psychology and neurology research, you also have this body of sociology and uh, of research. And what it turned out is that young people are taking longer to reach the developmental milestones of adulthood, that path to adulthood is become prolonged. And we know that in that sense that anyone, I have an emerging adult, um, right? Uh, you know, when will they truly be independent emotionally, financially, and practically? I'm not sure, but my 20 year old is a long way off. <laughs> you know, he's a great, able college student, but he is not an adult yet. And he relies on parents or other adults all the time. And, um, and so that is important implication for the juvenile justice system, right, is to recognize that when people say, well, my grandfather was fully employed, had their own apartment, their own car, you know, why, but, you know, but that's simply not true today for many reasons. But I think we just have to, we have to recognize that research um, as we talk about this. Um, there's really good news. Most, almost all youth will grow up and out of crime. By the time they reach 25, which interesting is when that final sort of prefrontal lobe is <laughs> fully developed, um, uh, uh, they will uh, grow up. They will not see them in the justice system. And the other thing that's really good news is that they're, this 18 to 25 year old is they're incredibly malleable, right? They're really susceptible for interventions, positive interventions, and rehabilitation. They are very responsive. They're not set in their ways yet. They don't know who they are, and they don't know what they want to be yet. And so there is a way in which you can take advantage of that moment in time um, to help steer them, right, the direction we all want them to go. Um, uh, the, um, the other thing I'll just mention, and you have a kind of a crazy chart that we hand out with like concentric circles like an onion, but... Um, uh, it is worth sort of thinking about this, especially if you're a parent or are um, responsible for someone this age, is that the youth justice system very much focuses on positive youth development. And that is a, a framework that many states have officially adopted within their justice system. And that is where you're focusing on building youth assets. 
right? You need, they need to reach these developmental milestones, they need to desist from crime, and they need to develop into healthy and productive citizens. And so you have these, what they call these sort of five domains that you look to that sort of create that pathway into um, healthy adulthood. And it's really important in that, in that, that, that journey, right, that youth are making and the system is, is uh, responding to is that responses in the justice system are youth appropriate. I, would, I think I, we said youth led last time. I think I'd say youth co-led. They have to get, you've got to get youth buy-in and they need to be part of it. They need to see how this is going to affect their future. It needs to be very concrete and it needs to be positively framed, right? These are their life goals. Where are they trying to get to? And if they're motivated and they see those goals, they will move towards those positive goals. The justice system traditionally in the adult side is punitive and it's for work, it focuses on the deficit. And I think that might be one of the many reasons why emerging adults right now in the adult system have the worst outcomes of any age group. They are overrepresented, and they have the highest recidivism rates, um, and they also have the highest mortality rate, especially for drugs. Um, so I think it's just really important to note is that the, by shifting in Vermont the framework from uh, to sort of lumping them in with 40, 50, 6 year olds in the adult system, you are grabbing this opportunity to provide tailored, developmentally approached responses. That not does not mean it's a pass. Does not mean you don't hold them accountable. Of course you do, but you're going to be doing it in a way that hopefully you're not going to then see them again cycling in and out of your justice system. Um, so yeah, so why is this so important? It, it, it is because of public safety. This is why um, we see this enormous activity across the country um, in this topic is that when you look at the data, you have to think, could we do much worse with emerging adults? I'm not sure. Um, so let's try something different. And, um, and Vermont is on the cusp. Vermont is the first state uh, to pass raise the age, but you have states at your heels. Um, you got Massachusetts, Illinois, and Connecticut. And now, as of last week, you have California in play. And I think you're gonna have Utah and Washington State as well. So you guys are leaders, but this really is catching on because when you look at the data, it's sort of shocking. And I think it's because we've not recognized that they are in a distinct developmental stage and we've not taken advantage of that. Um, so you're increasing accountability and responsibility, you're improving outcomes, and ultimately you are reducing costs. Because if you can get them out of the system, otherwise, once they're in the system, you will see them probably for the rest of their lives in one shape or other. Um, so I'm gonna um, quickly go just at the data. I think it's important to know, okay, so we've, we're raising the age. <laughs> <laughs> Who's coming into our youth system and what's the impact going to be? And so we have this sort of um, quick just reminder that um, there is this language differences in the, on the youth side of the fence in justice, but it's not just language, it actually has a, a really important significance, which is that at the end of the day, if, you've, if the court has found you committed an act, a delinquent act, you are adjudicated, you are not convicted. And that language is, is really specific to the juvenile system. We talk about dispositions. We don't talk about sentencing. Yes, you may lose your liberty. That is actually one of those dispositions you could have. But we're looking at it in terms of the youth lens. And we talk about, instead of a trial, we talk about merits. Um, you have the flow chart, um, which is in the report and maybe was also a handout. And I think that the things that I want to point out is that when you raise the age, you still are using police, state's attorneys, and defenders in the same way, right? They're, ki kids are being arrested, um, they are being prosecuted, um, you are reaching, you know, the, and they are um, receiving representation, hopefully zealous representation is constitutionally mandated. Um, but one of the, the, the two biggest differences, of course, is that you're now in the family division and uh, DCF, instead of DOC, the Department of Corrections, is, is the sort of, right, the, the state agency that has the oversight and the responsibility. Um, I think one of the interesting things about this flow chart um, is that there are a lot of what we call off-ramps. There's opportunities for diversion that's embedded in the youth justice system in a really important way. And that is to 
um, to be able to take the cases that can be appropriately served outside of the system and just keep those cases that actually really require the attention and the resources of the youth justice system. And the other thing I think is interesting is that when you look at your flow chart is that you have this, they call YAZI, this risk needs assessment instrument um, and tool that's used um, in the youth side, and that includes an assessment predisposition. So you're getting a lot of information that allows you to sort through your cases and again to become individualized, individually tailored. Um, case filings, this is important, this is the last fiscal year. You remember when you raise the age in Vermont, you're only looking at the non-Big 12 cases. And unfortunately, most of your cases are non-Big 12 cases, especially with youth. Um, that's, that's kind of typical. Um, but but your, the more serious cases are peeled off and will be handled separately. But even within the non-Big 12, what you see is the vast majority are misdemeanors, right? You have 18 year olds, you only have 47 who are not misdemeanors or felonies. Um, so this is important just to keep in mind as you think about it. It also helps that you've staggered implementation, right? You're bringing in the 18 year olds in July, you're giving yourself two years, and then you're bringing in the 19 year olds. That's um, a very smart move um, and allows the state to, um, uh, to sort of assess and adjust. Um, this next chart is shows you the different <coughs> offense types. Um, and what you're going to notice is that the, the darker blue is the eight, under 18 year olds, sort of the, all, the whole body of sort of delinquents. And then the yellow are 18, and then the kind of turquoisey kind of, I don't know, is 19. And what you notice is, right, the vast majority of these cases are public order offenses. That's like trespass and disorderly conduct. That's that kind of very typical youth-driven uh, crime. Um, and the things that really d differentiate a little bit with the 18 and 19-year-olds is you're going to see an increase in motor vehicle offenses. They have more access to cars. Um, and you're going to see a little bit more increase in drugs. And that is because this is a time of, of risk taking, right? And they're, they're experimenting. And it's also a time where some of the major mental health disorders can manifest themselves. And there's, a, there's some self medicating involved. Um, and so that's where you're going to sort of see some differences. But otherwise, it's not like suddenly you have a different pot. I think it's, you're going to, the group is going to say, aha, <laughs> we've seen this before. <laughs> because they do look a lot like their younger peers. When we looked at um, a, sort of a three-year uh, look at the data, and this is a little confusing, the lighter green is sort of the FY, fiscal year 17 and 18 combined with uh, fiscal year 19. But what is really encouraging news for Vermont is that you're trending in absolutely the right directions. Your diversion numbers of completions have gone up, the, um, and the convictions have gone down. And that means that you are looking at your other resources in the state, and Karen will talk about this, where it's very impressive, the restorative justice, the diversion um, systems that you have in play, um, and you want to be accessing those um, so that you can, again, the court can focus on the cases they really have to focus on, um, and you can get good results. The other good piece of news for Vermont is just that when you look at the 18 and 19 year olds who have been in the right the adult system and prosecuted in the adult system and they end up with a conviction almost 50 percent of them will get a fine only that's the disposition that's it and that tells you that then those kids there are a lot of those cases could be very ripe for diversion right you don't want to go this because the whole court process um, if you don't have to, if you can hold them accountable, you can make them understand the impact they've had, you can help them in some cases restore the harm through a restorative justice project, um, and then have them uh, hopefully, hopefully age out of the system. So I'm just going to say that when we looked at the court data, and, and again, uh, retired Judge Amy Davenport was super helpful with this, not just collecting the data, but thinking through and analyzing it is that we see that your numbers are going down as a state, which is great. Um, this is particularly notable because you recently incorporated 16 and 17 year olds in a new way in your youth side. And we have seen this in all the states who have raised the age, which is really fascinating. You know, there are these predictions that, oh, numbers are gonna go, like New York just went from 16 to 18. Uh, their numbers have gone way down. 
um, so this is just good news, um, that you're looking at a, a population that looks like very similar to your other population that you're used to in the juvenile system, the similar offenses, that a lot of them are low level and therefore should be ripe for diversion, um, and, um, and that a lot of them did not require any supervision in the adult side. Right? And so that's, again, that especially as we think of like DCF and taking on this new cases, we need to think about how are they going to use their resources in the best way possible. Um, I'm going to just touch very quickly on the fact that um, all states struggle with racial and ethnic disparities. That is a societal problem. There is not a justice system that does not. Um, and, and Vermont also has the same issues, right? 3% of the population, uh, youth population for Vermont are African American, but they are absolutely overrepresented in the delinquency system. And um, one of the sort of advantages um, uh, of Vermont is that there's federal uh, law, which the Federal Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, which which really um, ties in federal funds with, with the provision that states will both monitor the racial and ethnic disparities in their youth system and address any disparities that they can find and try to figure out what, where would be the best places to kind of intervene and, and change that trajectory. Nationally, 18 and 19 year olds have actually the highest rates of disparity of any age group. So African-American males are seven to nine times more likely to be incarcerated. So even though the numbers are somewhat hard to sort of accept, right, as a justice system to have these disparities, I think when you bring the 18, 19 year olds, the disparities will actually appear even higher. But the good news is because you're now including them in the justice system, they will now be part of that cadre of population that the state is looking at that they're tracking and that they're trying to address. And so that's a really a, a, a very positive thing that would be happening um, in Vermont. So with that, I'm gonna throw it over to, to Karen, who's gonna walk us through one of the topic areas that we've spent a lot of time looking at, um, which is diversion. Okay, thank you, Lael. And, um, and just, just take a, a, a little second to let you all know um, where I am right now is actually at the Coalition for Juvenile Justice um, it, um, every year puts on a conference on um, addressing racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile justice system. And I'm very proud to report that I'm here with a strong cohort from Vermont, which includes um, a school official, um, a school resource officer, a number of community advocates and um, community members, as well as members of um, the uh, uh, Children and Family Council for, for Prevention Programs. And um, it's been an invigorating conference. And um, it's, it's, again, we're all now thinking about these strategies to address um, structural um, uh, racism uh, through the lens of um, also raising the age. So it's, it's a really, really exciting um, moment in time. But um, uh, to pick up where uh, Will left off, um, you know, based on the data, uh, what we realized that we needed to dig into fairly quickly as part of this work was um, the use of diversion. Um, I think that, you know, this committee um, was very aware of um, uh, the Family Services Division and the workload, um, I'm sure would appreciate that we want to make sure that we're controlling the resources or we're, we're controlling the valve and the number of youth and emerging adults who hit our system so that we're reserving the resources of DCF for those youth who are highest risk and highest need. And so uh, without further ado, if we're on slide 19, Lail, yeah. um, um, uh, with respect to diversion, um, I think it's just important to note that, you know, throughout the country there is greater attention to increasing diversion opportunities and building a strong network of providers. And so, especially at conferences like where I am right now, I'm continually impressed with the fact that Vermont actually already has in place a very strong diversion network um, uh, throughout the state uh, with many off-ramps, which I think gets back to that handout that you all have in front of you on the youth justice flow chart. Um, so just so that you all have this in your mind as we're going through this part of the discussion. Um, 
we have strong diversion practices um, before a youth is ever even cited to court or charged. We also have diversion practices post-charge and then also post-adjudication. And then um, moving to the next slide, um, the current state of the community-based restorative justice program, just wanted to make sure that we all know who all these players are. We have the community justice centers, or the CJCs, that are um, funded through the Department of Corrections. We have the balanced and restorative justice um, programs, which are um, large, which uh, DCF is uh, the funder for um, <coughs> those programs. And then also uh, we have court diversion um, through the uh, Attorney General's Office, and I should really call that the court diversion program um, as I'm talking about it. So, um, you know, as I indicated, we have an incredibly robust network of these programs, and that uh, restorative justice is a well-established and trusted approach um, to both victim support, which is important for us to know, as well as youth accountability. And in uh, preparing for this report, um, we can share with you that, you know, the programs have some similarities and key differences. And it is our observation and the stakeholder group um, supported this observation that the um, counties where um, the programs are, are, uh, under, are housed under one organization, that it was our observation that um, the referrals and stakeholder communication is stronger in those places. And that also it's important to know that there is variability in how the programs are utilized. And that has a lot to do with, you know, the, the players and um, school involvement and local practice, um, such as school referrals, can really make a difference in how these programs are used, um, as well as having a presence of a strong pre-charge program. And, um, you know, I think it's also important to note um, you know, the, there is this prosecutorial discretion of using a community-based program um, in lieu of charging. I do need to say that while we did not do an, an in-depth analysis of all the differences and what was driving those, um, we do want you to, to have in mind that there are differences. So moving to the next slide, um, these are our recommendations, that we seek opportunities to collaborate with schools, um, and also uh, doing outreach to members of law enforcement. And those two bullets actually really directly um, dovetail into the third bullet, um, which is this uh, goal. And this is uh, you know, uh, a, a goal that we want to strive for, um, is to increase the use of free charge diversion to um, divert 50 to 60% of cases, even from hitting any formal system involvement. And then, um, and with respect to the formal court diversion program, which would be the cases that are accepted um, post charge, that we would like to increase. Um, and in many counties, this is a this is really a, a matter of maintaining uh, 25 to 30 percent of cases. Um, um, uh, uh, sorry, lost my thought here. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of cases um, being referred to um, uh, court diversion, and um, also. And this is a, all of these were supported by the stakeholder group, but there's acknowledgement that um, we need to evaluate and address barriers for youth participation. And an easy one is that, you know, when, um, when a youth has a meeting, um, knowing some of those, um, uh, the realities that Lael already presented to you, that it's really important that we use different strategies to remind them of their meetings and to make, um, uh, make it really possible and concrete for them to participate. Um, and I think I just um, also want to acknowledge that um, over the last couple of years, um, we've seen some changes in our statute that has allowed for a really strong foundation in place um, to expand uh, the commitment of, um, you know, expanding diversion and that um, already we're seeing that state attorneys are making more referrals and I, um, I, I think that they've made, and I think this is worth noting for the group, that they've made considerable progress in, um, in making more referrals over the last couple of years. So we, we believe that the numbers are going in the right direction. And with that, I'd like to hand the floor to Judge Grierson regarding the Family Division of Superior Court. Thanks, Karen. Um, I, I guess I would start by reminding uh, committee uh, that the juvenile docket, if you will, encompasses uh, 
omissions cases, it encompasses uh, abuse and neglect cases, the delinquency, youthful offender, and truancy. There is only one court in the state, Chisholm County, where a juvenile court uh, has the docket every single day. And it has been like that for as long as certainly I've been on the bench. Um, the other courts over the time I've been on the bench, most of them were one day a week, uh, sometimes two. But the increase in uh, the CHINS filing, the abuse and neglect docket, as a result of the opiate epidemic. Uh, courts that normally would be one day a week, when I last sat in Barry, for example, um, before I took this position, it was one day a week. They're now expanding, have expanded to two. And that's, that's similar in, in most counties. Um, and I will tell you that uh, even now, before this influx of cases, the judge are saying we need more time in the juvenile court. Um, the juvenile cases, of course, have a priority over every other five uh, criminal, civil, domestic. But the problem is that the, the, the courts, at least from my perspective, the courts, the juvenile docket has been expanded really to the extent that it can be without seriously impacting uh, the other dockets. In other words, if I were to expand uh, a juvenile court docket by even one day or a half day, that means another day or half day missing uh, from another docket. And so the, the pressures are impacting all of the dockets. And I think what's important to remember as we go forward, as I said, this is a challenge. If you look at um, slide 11, uh, that's the one that talked about the filings um, that we can anticipate with 18 year olds. It would amount to, if you take all the 18 year olds that are now in uh, criminal court filings and bring them into the juvenile docket, that would increase the caseload alone in the juvenile docket by about a third. And, and clearly the court, um, nor the parties, uh, can uh, absorb that kind of increase. So this, what Karen was just talking about, the need to divert cases, free charge, free merit, I think is to making this 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 workable um, and the state's attorneys have done a good job in the last few years um, of increasing the number of cases they have diverted but remember that they've always had the authority to divert and it wasn't until the legislature gave them a nudge with a presumption on certain cases uh, that they that these numbers have gone up um, the number on the number of cases, the other slide that I think is important, so we have a potential of a one-third increase in filings, the one that is also, I think, significant in terms of what we do with these cases is on uh, slide 14, where we're talking about the cases that were disposed of in a criminal docket with fines only because that was about 42% of the cases, if I'm reading this chart right. When those cases come into juvenile court, we have no ability to impose fines in a juvenile context. And as far as I know, no one involved in this uh, discussion has, is, is urging the legislature to go in that direction, which means you've got a large number of cases coming in that we have to find another disposition that historically in the criminal docket uh, did not involve any supervision by the Department of Corrections. It was simply pay a fine and, and you're done. And so we have to look at alternatives uh, available in the juvenile docket to do that same thing and not involve people in services that they, they don't otherwise need. Um, and so we have to be wary of that. I think and I will say that, and I think most of the committee members have probably heard me make this argument before, for as much work and, and uh, that the state's attorneys have done with respect to diversion, and they should be commended uh, for their work. Um, this project, as I said, can't be viewed in isolation. And um, as an, another example, I was at a sentencing commission meeting uh, the other day, 
And I think uh, one of the recommendations coming out of the Sentencing Commission, although it deals with the criminal docket, is going to be for the legislature to consider giving the court, meaning the judge, the authority to divert cases uh, over the objection of the state's attorneys. It's not one of the recommendations that's in front of you, but uh, going forward, um, I think it's something that is at least worth considering. Um, so moving, moving ahead on the slide, um, and Karen or Leo did point out the time frame for a juvenile case uh, on slide 23, essentially 60 days from filing to disposition, meaning the case comes in, first appearance in court, and then the case is supposed to be uh, resolved with a disposition in 60 days. I will be the first to say that those timelines are very rarely met. Um, and we have to do, and I say we, I, I think the judiciary has to do a better job of making parties and attorneys mm -hmm. adhere to those uh, timelines, particularly with this influx of cases coming into the system. Um, we have to be uh, more conscious of those timelines and enforce them. Um, these cases can't, nobody benefits by these cases not being resolved, be it the, the individuals who are charged with the delinquency or facing delinquency or the victim. Um, and so one of the things we have found in a number of dockets uh, that oftentimes the attorneys don't get a chance to talk about cases and resolve them until they actually come to the court. And the court hearing, if you will, call it a, a status conference, uh, the court hearing is not the best place for the parties to discuss the case. In other words, there has to be a discussion, an opportunity for the state and the defense to talk about these cases essentially outside of the courtroom. But sometimes they need the temperature of the court to make sure they do talk. And since they're not frequently talking outside of court, one of the uh, proposals that, that I've made, um, and there are others uh, involved in this discussion, would be to schedule essentially conferences on a regular court day, but do it in such a way that the attorneys don't have to come into the courtroom uh, unless they have a resolution. In other words, it gives them an opportunity to discuss these cases and hopefully reach settlement. Um, right now, under the current system, 15 days after the initial appearance in court, the parties that are required to come to court for what's called a, a pre-trial uh, or, or status conference. I don't find that those conferences really accomplish much. So we would use that same time frame, but allow the attorneys to come to the courthouse that day um, and give them the opportunity to try to resolve these cases. If not, what we're going to try to do with this docket, with this influx of the 18-year-olds, is create a docket that says, okay, if you don't resolve it at the 15-day mark, um, you will get a, a final hearing date, and there will be no continuances uh, from that date. Um, and, and hold people's feet uh, to those timelines. And it, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy from the judiciary's perspective or from the attorneys, but I think it's a, really a, a cultural change, if you will, um, because these cases need to be heard. And one way of doing it is to change the focus of the hearings when they come to court. And when I say cases can't be continued, obviously there are circumstances of which no one has control. Um, unavailability of a witness, uh, sickness, um, 
those types of issues. There may be some cases that are more complicated, but I think for a vast majority of the types of cases coming in, if they're not resolved through diversion, they would be the equivalent of misdemeanor offenses in the criminal docket. And they are generally speaking one or two witness cases. Uh, and there's no reason why those types of cases can't be put on a strict calendar. And it, it is up to the court to hold the parties to that calendar. And um, that, that's one of the recommendations uh, that we're making. We talked about this briefly at the, the Vermont Law School conference that Karen mentioned. And I have heard uh, a comment since that time about um, folks involved in the process thinking that that may be uh, beneficial. Uh, in other words, they're willing to, to change their thinking. So what we hope to do between now and July is perhaps pilot this concept with the current cases uh, in one or two counties to see if, if it can make a difference so that when the cases start coming in in July, uh, maybe we have a frame of reference to see what's working and what is um, it, it's, I guess it's a long way of me saying that we're facing a significant increase in the caseload and both in diverting cases out of the system and the way we handle these cases in the system uh, need to change uh, because there's just there's just no more hearing time available uh, and we have to uh, maximize uh, that hearing time or the opportunities for hearing time. Okay. So um, I'm going to take on sort of the next topic, which is, you know, after the court process is sort of complete or most of it merits have been found, um, the issue of probation. So uh, it is the most common disposition nationally at the end of any case, both a juvenile case or an adult case that there be some kind of probationary supervision. And this has become very much a hot topic nationally and a lot more research is being devoted to it. I think in the past we sort of just let that slide and, and didn't think too much of it. Um, and I think what's interesting is that um, that there's, turns out that there's, ironically, if you, inc you uh, have um, sort of intense supervision for a low risk youth or an individual, um, you actually could increase recidivism rates. I mean, I guess we kind of know that as a, you know, parenting or looking after young people, but turns out science has proven that's true. And so you want to really reserve, just like you want the court to focus on the cases that can't be resolved outside, right, getting the parties together. Similarly, you want DCF to be focusing on their sort of interventions and supervision for not the low-risk youth, they want the low-risk youth to have another option. And it's what research says is being shorter and more focused is good for kids. When you drag stuff on, they can't even remember sometimes life's changed so much in a year, right, in their life. Um, for us, it's a blink of the eye, but um, uh, you know, you want to be, hold them sort of accountable, you want to do it, and you want to do it, again, linked towards their personal goals, right? This is the positive youth development um, uh, framework. Um, uh, what we f have found is, um, looking in the Vermont, um, is that, uh, it, it is, as Judge Gerson pointed out, we have this group of 18, 19 year olds now, we're currently just getting a fine only and moving on. There's no equivalent, that there's no fine in the, in the family court, and for good reasons, that kind of contravenes the, the values and the goals of a juvenile court, and in fact, many states that do allow fines in a juvenile court are abolishing them. And there's also a question of really who pays the fine anyways, right? It's, it's going to be burdening to the family. And so it's going to be important for Vermont to find alternatives, and those alternatives need to be immediate and short term and not, re not rely on, you know, increased supervision and, and that staff time from DCF. And, it, and one of the things that um, some states are really looking at is trying to find some targeted programs. So if your issue is shoplifting or if your issue is whatever, that you can have a targeted program on that. Um, and we don't have to always do such a deep dive. We can tailor it. Um, the recommendations are to continue to not use fines. And I, I think that 
the task, um, the stakeholders group was certainly on board on that. Um, to again, to expand these immediate short-term targeted options. Um, uh, to increase some direct referrals to the community. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you don't want young people relying on the justice system for services that they need, right? You want them to be connected to the groups in their own towns and, and areas where they're going to, when the case is long gone, they're going to still have access to them, we're going to have developed relationships and mentorships, et cetera. And so, so instead of just sort of the blanket sort of standard probationary period, you want to think about there's some cases that can go directly, you know, not that there's some supervision, but they're going to be served by those community groups. Um, so you want to end that sort of routine use of probation, just the default, whatever else does, you just do that. The other issue is proportionality, right? We looked at sort of the length in which young people are on that kind of the probation period. And um, again, short, sweet, and targeted is what you're looking for, right? So misdemeanor, you know, really beyond six months, unless it's some extraordinary case, they really, they, they need to have moved on. And similarly for a felony, 12 months is a long time in a youth's life. Um, and of course, you want to incorporate positive youth development. You want youth involvement. Always do better if they feel like they're part of the process than just digging in their heels and resisting. And that's going to require some training and support for the Family Service Division who are, you know, are taking on a, a, a bigger group of youth, a somewhat older group of youth, some of the course same issues, but there are different stages of life. Um, and um, just as Judge Grissom was saying, for the courts, they need to be able to sift through those cases well and focus on the cases that really need uh, the intervention. Karen, I'm throwing it to you to cover um, uh, physical custody. Okay, thank you. So I'm um, going to skip to 531. Um, I think especially the folks in this room appreciate that um, when uh, DCF has legal custody of a youth, that it means that we are their parents uh, and that we can make and do make um, decisions on their behalf and that um, this is a puzzle for us to um, work through uh, with respect to raising the age of, um, of juvenile court jurisdiction because as I'm sure everybody appreciates that the age of majority is 18 and that um, that means that emerging adults are their own legal entity and so we will need to define what this means for um, DCF and that courts will actually need to grant physical custody um, to DCF in cases where that's appropriate, much in the same way that the adult court um, grants that authority to the Department of Correction. So um, DCF will need to consider where it will place use, including um, secure and non-secure settings. Um, and. Uh, the DOC currently, I think I just, it's worth noting, the DOC currently holds very few 18 to 19 year, 19 year olds in its physical custody. Um, and at the time of uh, drafting the report, the point in time count was um, two detained and four sentenced 18 and 19 year olds. Um, so going to the next slide, uh, for our recommendation that um, DCF should continue its aim of operating a continuum of care for residential treatment and out of home placements for all youth um, in the delinquency system. And that um, you'll see when we get to the statutory changes that we will actually need to modify our statute so that if DCF has custody of eight, an 18 or 19 year old that we're being clear that we need physical custody and not legal custody and that um, uh, you know, as, as, as sometimes happens in our world, that um, DCF is also working on a simultaneous um, uh, report that will, is due to the legislature in January regarding the placement and treat, treatment options that will actually delve into this a lot deeper. Um, so moving along to victims' rights, um, I just want to note here that um, as we were preparing for all the conversations and analysis that we would need to have, that the first um, big topic that we tackled was victims' rights. Um, 
in part because I think that there can be confusion around this and also in response to what we were hearing from victim advocates uh, and others in the field that this was a concern that they wanted to make sure that we gave priority to. So um, um, on page, uh, sorry, on slide 34, Lail, um, I think it's uh, a great place for us to start is just to note for the committee here that um, we have strong victim rights in place already. That um, uh, We have an incredibly strong statutory scheme that supports um, their right to a victim advocate, the right to be informed. Um, they also have the right for notification of release of a uh, juvenile delinquent from secure, a secure setting, and so that applies to the youth who are in our legal custody now. Um, and I also should note it's interesting, in Title 33, we don't usually refer to listed crimes or non-listed crimes, uh, but with respect to this piece around victims' rights, that victims of a listed crime, um, even though we don't usually use that language in the juvenile context, but a victim of a listed crime, um, if they request it, um, can receive notification um, of, this, of this release of the youth from a secure setting. And then finally, um, that, uh, that victims have the right to both um, restitution uh, um, and compensation. So in our findings, um, I will share with you that DCS rarely receives a request for notification from a victim. Um, also that it's worth noting that um, DCS does have a domestic, um, domestic and sexual violence unit that can assist with juvenile cases involving those types of crimes. Um, and that while there is a process in place for requesting um, restitution, it's frankly very confusing and goes underutilized. Um, and then finally, as in, in all things, I think that um, we can always strengthen our communication and especially in this area with respect to the communication between victim advocates, the family division, and DCF. So our recommendations are, um, that we want to clarify that uh, victim advocates should be provided in all cases and strive for a consistent dissemination of information. Um, <clears throat> we're recommending evaluating the process for requesting and receiving restitution. And I'd like to note that the Center for Conflict and Services um, is willing uh, to, and will be taking a lead on that particular bullet point. And um, finally, that we need to formally create regular opportunities for um, strong coordination between DCF family services workers and victim advocates. And I'm really proud to report um, under Lindy Boudreaux's leadership that we are actually already making some significant headway with both the first and third bullet points. Um, just, um, I want to point out that she is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yes, hi, Lindy. <laughs> so, um, so then uh, moving right along to the operational plan for um, um, DCF. Um, so uh, just some background for you all. Um, uh, you know, as we've already touched on, that we have uh, this broad mandate in the Family Services Division of both child protection and supervision of youth adjudicated delinquents. Um, I think we are really proud, and I, I, I'm sure Representative Pugh might have some comments about this as well, but we are really proud of the fact that we apply the principles of social work um, to our casework and really to how, the, uh, how we run the division. Um, so that means that we're, we, uh, whenever possible, we are looking at the whole family structure um, as well as um, you know, the way that we communicate, I think is deeply undergirded by the values of social work, and we're very proud of that. Um, the Family Services Division, as you all know, has seen significant caseload pressures from both child protection, as well as, and Judge Gerson noted this for you, as well as youth adjudicated as youthful offenders. And just as a sidebar, because I'm not sure that all of you live in the same realm that we do all the time, and, and knowing and, and fully understanding the different statuses but what we mean here is this status that um, allows for um, uh, um, emerging adults to be supervised by both Department 
uh, um, for, for Children and Families and the Department of Corrections. So it's a much more labor-intensive approach than um, just a straight juvenile delinquency. And then finally, um, and now that you all have met Lindy in the room, um, uh, there's only one person in the, the Family Services Division Central Office who is in a dedicated role of supporting field staff um, as well as policy on juvenile delinquency, at-risk youth, and adolescents. So these things were all are really important in terms of thinking through um, what are the important pieces that we needed to consider in our findings. Um, so um, it's worth noting that GCF staff work very closely with their local barge provider, which we talked about earlier on in this um, presentation. And um, the barge provider is key for supporting youth and successful completion of probation. Um, and uh, that's also where we are seeing um, restorative justice processes and outreach to victims and just additional support and case management for the youth. So we really work hand in glove uh, with um, the local barge providers. Um, there are um, many DCF staff who handle both juvenile cases as well as child protection cases. Um, the Family Services Division Deputy Commissioner, Christine Johnson, does not have any direct reports focused on juvenile delinquent or juvenile justice. And so what I mean by that is there's nobody reporting to her in the leadership level um, who is exclusively focused on uh, juvenile justice. I'm sorry. And, um, sorry? Karen, I'm sorry, I'm breaking all my rules. Um, then who does Lindsay report to? Who's Lindy report to? If it's not Lindy, you report to um, it's a director. She's a director of um, policy and planning. Um, for the record, this is Lindy Boudreau, uh, DCF. Um, I report to Suzanne Chibley, who's a policy and practice manager. Okay, and she reports to Christine. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's no, it, it gets a little bit confusing in terms of considering our system, but I think the main takeaway here is that um, the, 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 the Family Services Division, in terms of how they have structured um, the support that goes out to the, to the field staff, that um, understandably, because of our caseload um, percentages, it's more heavily weighted on child protection. And I think in sharing these findings with you, I think it really um, helps to illustrate that point for you. Um, but I think it's also worth noting that we're seeing these increases already with the youthful offender caseload, and then also we will be anticipating some increases with um, the raise the age effort. So this is all to help kind of get us to where we ended up with the recommendations. Um, I just wanted to note two more things, and that is that victim advocates have requested that DCF have a point or a point of contact um, to work through um, case questions and that sort of thing. And then um, finally, that um, currently we do have a staff person in the commissioner's office, uh, a juvenile justice coordinator, whose role it is to staff the Children and Family Council for, for, for Prevention Pro, uh, I can't say that, uh, for prevention programs. And it's important to note, this is actually a federally funded um, um, role um, and also that this is a, um, a staff person who um, can support uh, you know some of the system work with respect to implementation of Act 201. So here are our recommendations. Um, we want to clearly differentiate the casework policy training and leadership structure within FSC between child protection and juvenile justice slash at risk youth. Um, and I think here. Um, when we talked about this in our internal conversations, uh, some of the language that we were using is the way to, to protect both caseloads and the work that's required is to have this differentiation. Um, and uh, we are recommending at the writing of this report um, two phases to this. Uh, phase one is to address the central office infrastructure um, uh, by allowing uh, more than just Lindy to hold all of this for the entire field staff, that we need additional support um, to do all of this work. And, um, and that we're, so what we've been thinking about is, you know, a way to have better, more coordinated oversight of juvenile delinquency um, um, and ensuring that we have all the systems that we need in place for staff. Uh, 
um, that that needs a little more, um, we need more people to be working on that. And then finally, with phase two, reassessing um, the needs of direct service staff. And um, as noted with, um, you know, Barge being, um, you know, a, a community provider who works hand in glove with us and is our very trusted partner, that we need to increase sources to community providers to support diversion from the system um, as that is a role that they play. So if you look at slide 40, um, you can see here uh, what we're thinking about. Um, so um, all of the yellow um, squares or rectangles are existing positions and then the blue ones, um, and I need to note this is actually, I should have changed this in the slide, but the first blue one, the Juvenile Justice Coordinator, that's Elizabeth Morris, who I was describing earlier. The, her role is federal, federally funded to support the work of the council. Um, but part of our federal funds actually require, as Lael touched on earlier, <coughs> not only are we monitoring racial, racial and ethnic disparities, but we also have to monitor any place that holds youth to ensure that there is sight and sound separation from adults in the system. And so we actually have a compliance monitor. This is not a position, this is a contract, but right? it shouldn't appear as if it's actually a position. So that's an error on that slide. Uh, apologies for that. And so what we're recommending here is that we repurpose positions so that we can actually have a juvenile justice director of operations who is at the same level of the director of operations um, uh, that we have in place currently. Many of you may know Brenda Gooley. And so the idea here is that it would allow um, the, uh, Brenda's position to be more focused on the child protection side of the house and that this role would be more focused on, on, on uh, juvenile justice. And, um, and then we would, we we're looking to add a um, juvenile justice victim liaison policy and um, um, practice specialist. Um, and and I, it, I just want to mention here that um, we, it may be that we add somebody to the existing um, a victim advocate unit for domestic violence and sexual violence, or it may be that we actually have a dedicated person. We're still working through the details that will work best within the um, existing infrastructure, but we are looking to repurpose the position to um, be focused on that, and then of course um, uh, the administrative piece as well. Um, I'm going to keep going, not being able to read the room unless anybody has a question that I need to clarify. You're good to go. Okay, thank you. So the next um, slide is focused on the um, changes needed to implement Act 201. And um, so what we mean here is that, you know, when, when we were, um, you know, analyzing Act 201, um, uh, uh, when it was still being discussed in the legislature, there were a number of things that we just hadn't had a chance yet to imagine um, would need to be changed. And so this process of, um, which I think was really smart on the legislature's part, this process of giving the, us the time to plan ensured that we could also do this deep analysis to ensure that there would be no barriers in statute to um, successful implementation of, um, of the law. So there are five statutory changes um, that uh, the Juvenile Justice Stakeholder Group has recommended. Um, and as I understand it from the Joint Justice Oversight Committee uh, meeting last week, um, Senator Sears shared with the group that he has already put in a drafting request uh, with respect to um, uh, these changes. So they include um, clarifying and setting the age of supervision for the department um, for children and families. So we basically need to make sure that we're raising that age to ensure that um, we would have ample time uh, to work with um, folks adjudicated in manly court. And so the idea there is that we would extend it a year and a half beyond the birthday of jurisdiction, and which is what it is currently. We just have to raise that um, to be commensurate with 18 and 19 year olds coming into the system. Um, as I noted for you already, we need to clarify um, and um, adjust custody um, to include that physical custody piece uh, for 18 and 19 year olds. We also want to make sure that the Tamarack program, which is currently available for adults, um, would be available to 18 and 19 year olds regardless of the court handling their case. Um, 
and then um, we just put in a big bucket for poor Bryn um, that we're calling technical corrections to address any references to age. Um, so we'll just have to do a deep dive to make sure that we haven't missed any other references to age that um, would need to be adjusted to make sure that the law goes, um, when the law goes into effect. And then um, finally, uh, the citation of emerging adults uh, by law enforcement to court. We'll need to clarify that as well. Okay. Um, and then I think it's you, Lael. It's me. Okay, data. A really sexy topic. Um, uh, but I'm going to dive right in and say that uh, the report, which I know is long, but it also includes a pretty detailed analysis of data in Vermont and gives you a list of what is available, what relevant is readily available, what of relevant data sets are available but not readily available, that they're out there but, you know, someone have to, you know, bring them together to be able to monitor, and then potentially what what pieces are missing. And the two key findings uh, we bring to the table is that the data varies tremendously in terms of coverage and reliability. Uh, again, nothing unique to Vermont. This is the case for all states, just, <laughs> just putting that out there. But good to recognize and you know, it's always good to know and to be working on that. And that so, a lot of the data points are not connected to those positive youth outcomes, right? So when, uh, when you're studying this, you want to make sure that you're, you're collecting the data to know if you're moving youth along to reaching these important milestones because that's what's going to get them out of your justice system. So we have some recommendations, um, which is really important. If you have data, you need to, you want to be compiling in an aggregate way, nothing personal, you know, confidentiality, breaches or anything. And you want to be looking at that on a regular basis. Um, you want to identify somebody in the state to, 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 to look at that and generate an annual report. That you know somebody needs to sort of take on that responsibility. They can help identify again ongoing what's missing, um, so that that can get filled in and fixed. Um, and I think this is a really wonderful opportunity to actually do some research on outcomes. You, and it's not just, it'd be nice for the nation, right, because this is where the country's moving, but you have two years before you're going to bring in another cadre of youth. You are going to want to know how it's going. Um, and uh, so take advantage of that. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the nice things about the way you've done it in such a thoughtful process in generating this report is you now have baselines. Um, and so, you know, that was a lot of work, but it's been done. Take advantage of it. Build on it. Um, and, uh, and keep planning out that. So those are my words of wisdom, if that's what it is. Um, and that really comes to the conclusion. I know we're going to have time for Q&A. So, but Karen, do you want to kick us off? And then Judge Gerson, and then if there's anything left, I'll say a word. Yeah, last words by Lael. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, looking forward here, just a quick recap that um, the key to successful communication um, uh, will be Vermont's use of robust and effective diversion, streamlining the court process as Judge Grierson described, which also I should note had the full support immediately from the entire juvenile justice um, stakeholder group just um, in terms of thinking that through for better outcomes for both victims and um, the juveniles. And I, I thought that was just something worth sharing with you all. Um, and then also strengthening the interagency communication uh, and then ensuring a full continuum of dispositional options. So I think in conclusion, the stakeholders have been given an opportunity to collectively examine the current system, identify critical areas to improve upon, and find ways to better serve all youth. We'll be able to tap into this incredible expertise that we have in our state. And um, it's just incredibly exciting. I know that we have work ahead of us, um, but it is still incredibly, incredibly exciting to be a part of the state that's leading the nation in emerging adult justice reform. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Lil and Karen and Brian. We have, I want to say, to be respectful of the person who's actually in the room, who <laughs> I imagine is driving back to Manhattan um, tonight. Um, she said, as long as I'm on the road, 
um, by 1.30. She gave, me, she, she gave us legislative time. Yeah. So um, we have about 15 minutes at this point to um, have questions and, and um, clarifications from folks. So take it away. I, I, I asked you to wait. I'm waiting. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 before. I, no, my question is for Judge Grierson to start off, so I want to wait until oh. um, you've had a chance to um, talk with Leah. Well, and I will have other questions. One, I want to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of the legislature for your for the part of the um, Justice Center, the Emerging Adult Program, <laughs> um, for doing this. And um, I want to say for your recommendations that we continue to evaluate. Um, because if we do not put, um, if we not if we don't put resources into evaluation then we won't know whether it makes sense to move um, on um, or how to move on or what changes that we need to make. Um, I'm not quite sure who some of my questions are for, so go well, ahead. Okay, yeah. well, well let, let's go, you know, go to data and are there recommendations for um, how we might uh, expand our data collection so that we know we're moving in the right direction Based on what we've already uh, done, so yeah, there are, and there's some there's some particular data sets that we identify in the um, in the report okay. that would be helpful to know, and okay. and just remember that you know one of the reasons why it's tricky is that you had the 18, 19 year olds on the adult side, and you had the under 18 in the family division, and right, and that so they're being collected in different ways or in different agencies. Each agency has their own way of collecting data. And so that, I mean, that just was a, a, a natural challenge. Um, uh, but now you know the 19-year-olds are coming too, and so trying to align and make sure you're collecting data on the 19-year-olds before they come in and get incorporated in your juvenile system would be really important. The stakeholder group has been marvelous, um, and uh, some of the folks in that room, and um, just Chris can talk more about it, but you know, the folks in the judiciary that have you know know about this data and it's their job to call it and, and and do all that are part of that group, and so that's been that's an, an sort of amazing resource for all of you. If that group is continues um, in such a thoughtful way, um, I think that you can fill in the gaps and make sure it's all there. But it would take a conscious effort. I mean, right? And that's where I think the recommendation is to designate some entity to be the lead. Um, because I think it's easy to let, you know, everyone's so busy, it'd be easy to let that slip. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth making that really a prominent feature of your rollout of uh, Raise the H. Is it, so to ask the question, was there any discussion within the stakeholder group about who might take that lead? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, technology and the communication systems that might need to be in place for this all to happen. Right. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, I, I like Karen and Judge Gerson, who are members, say, I, I would say that um, I, I could see a couple of different opportunities uh, within Vermont to do it. Um, but I do think there is value to have sort of asking that question to the stakeholders because you got everybody in a room. It may be a little bit of a hot potato. You take it. You take it. But I don't think so. This is a group that sort of wraps their arms around it. So I don't know if Judge Gerson and Karen, you want to. Forge ahead on that. Yeah, I would think, from my perspective, I, I would certainly need someone who's more technology savvy than I am to you know, respond from the judiciary. I'll, again, I'll, I'll remind the, the committee and folks that we're in the process now of going from our old system to a new system. Uh, the the Win, uh, Wyndham, Windsor, and Orange region is just starting that process. So. Um, we've got a lot of uh, technology issues uh, already going forward, mm -hmm. but I, I'm certainly willing to talk with uh, with folks about who should take the lead on that. Yeah. Okay. We have another yeah. question. Oh, sorry, Karen. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, Senator Lyons, that I appreciate the question, and I think this requires some more discussion. But um, one thing I really, really appreciated is that um, we have very reliable court data, and that um, John Sanborn, who is a member of the Juvenile Justice Stakeholder Group, has been working on creating a new dashboard that would allow us to get our hands around the data and understand it a little bit more easily. And she and Lindy Boudreaux have been working very closely. So just to say it, I think we're making some good inroads, but to answer your question, this is a recommendation in the report that we will need to continue to work through. Yeah, not the first thing that's gonna happen, obviously. But um, the other, the, the other real quick question, I, I don't need a, a long answer, but um, the supervision piece obviously becomes um, interesting because it, it, there'd be some supervision based within DCF, um, within the restorative justice uh, programs. How do we see the supervision being carried out and allocated? And it seems like a huge job. <laughs> so I think. The, the idea here is that we would overlay this um, on the existing structure for how we delineate our caseload. Okay. That said, you know, per a number of the recommendations in the report, um, and, you know, and Lil and I both touched on this, that we will continue to need to um, train, um, train our staff and actually there are some differences for 18 to 19 year olds, especially when looking at their community supports and their goals are going to be changing. You may not be looking to support an 18 or 19 year old with completing high school because they may have already done that. It, it, it's likely to be transitioning to thinking about employment and career readiness and those sorts of adjustments. And so um, again, the division is already um, uh, you know, taking steps to bring in the training and to make more robust um, uh, training available through um, both foundations as well as for um, the existing staff. So I would say that's an ongoing um, part of this, but this is what is nice. It's not that we have to build the, the system anew, that we have an existing system that we just need to make sure that that can absorb these cases um, um, uh, and, and, and well. Mary Beth. And I'm wondering if there's you know, is there any way there's a look-see at those cases? You know, I, I know that's a very challenging question, but now that kind of the light bulb has gone on and we realize this is um, kind of the trajectory of an emerging adult, is there any way we, we look at those cases again? So, um, the cases yes, okay. that have already been adjudicated? Yes. Yes. Um, and um, uh, Representative Redman, I want to make sure I understand your question. Um, is it about the types of supervision they currently have in the Department of Corrections, or was there something else I should address? It's more of an, a question, an idealistic question of um, the fact, and, and that's usually where I come from. Um, but I like that. <laughs> Um, those individuals, you know, you, you, it's a very small number, but there are two detained, four sentenced. And does any of this new approach inform those cases? Um, oh, I see. Yes. So I did do a deep dive with um, uh, with Colin Bullard from the Department of Corrections, who um, is in charge of um, population management. I think it's is part of his title, but I'm, I'm sure I messed that up in some way. Um, and so we just we did it. We did a deep dive on those six particular cases, and you know both of us agreed. And, and I, you know, I, I, in conferring with Lindy about this, that a few of those cases would be very appropriate for the type of supervision that um, DCF provides. But what's interesting, though, is that we were more focused, frankly, on the rest of the body of cases, not the ones that have ended up in physical custody, because I think that gives us an even better sense for um, who's going to be hitting our system. And the fact of the matter is that most of them are misdemeanors, you know, as we've described, most of them are getting a very light touch, if anything, mm -hmm. by the Department of Corrections. And so that's where, um, with respect to Lael's um, overview of 
our post merits options, we were really talking through those because we really just have one option in, um, you know, in juveniles for juvenile delinquency, and that's probation. Mm -hmm. And so we want to expand the types of options that are available so that we also can have commensurate light touches similar to what you see in um, in the Department of Corrections and, and still age, in, uh, age appropriate. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Well, this is um, Anne, and I will fully admit I'm coming from the perspective of human services more than the um, court system. And I may have misunderstood some things that were being said, so I'm trying to get some clarity. Um, on one of the slides, um, it says convictions resulting in fines only for 18 and 19-year-olds. Um, it looks like that number is, you know, good. I mean, it's, it's increasing. Then one of the recommendations is that um, that they're not that fines aren't a good um, thing. So, um, how, how do we how, how do we marry that? How do we? Yeah, this is what is happening in the courts, and your recommend the recommendation that I thought I heard was that fines was not an effective strategy because who's paying them? So, um, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm just noting what I see as a, um, a, a challenge. So I think I'll, I'm going to speak a little bit about this is sort of a pattern around the country, is that in the adult side, um, uh, the collateral consequences of getting an actual conviction is enormous. Um, right, and it's housing, employment, um, mortgages for life. And so sometimes it's judges, or this is not just Vermont, I'm talking just nationally, you know, they're, sort of, they're convicted, that's a, that's a huge deal, and then they just throw in a fine at the, sort of to say something. Um, whether 18 and 19 years are paying fines, we don't know. Uh, we know if they are, it's really not them, it's, right. it's other people. So, but when, you, when we were thinking about this 18, 19 year old, looking at those numbers and thinking, okay, we're gonna incorporate it in the, in the family division, one thought was, should we allow, should the recommendation be that the family division is allowed to assess fines? Because so right now it's not. Um, you just can't assess fines. Oh, so this is clearly they're saying they shouldn't have that. Exactly. Okay. So we're saying let's not change that. I mean, they, okay. they still can, the restitution can be paid to victims, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But let's not make that, let's not inherit that from the adult mm -hmm. system. Let's think about it in the development of the appropriate perspective and say, okay, if we're not going to use fines, Let's also not do 12 months of supervision. Let's think of, um, you know, some targeted approach. And does that help? No, it does. It does yeah. help. I mean, some of this is. Um, yeah. I'm just learning. Yeah, yeah. So trying to understand <laughs> some what I'm hearing. Right. Um, and the other was, um, I think it was you who said, who reiterated the point that sometimes for um, certain juveniles. Um, more is less, that you yeah. want to have a light touch right. in terms of supervision or supports. Right. And then later on we hear about how under, un, that there are a group of um, emerging adults who are not just supervised but one, but supervised by two in terms of both DOC and family services and maybe they're different youth. Um, but if they are the same, maybe we need to look at this concept of dual supervision. The youthful offenders definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that what that is? Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The youthful yeah. offenders are yes. supervised. It could be dual supervision, but if all these cases come into the juvenile court, it would be DCF. Okay. Right, and I, I, I think that um, especially once uh, the Razy Age effort goes into effect, I think that we will naturally see that um, youthful offender will be used less and less and less. Okay. And um, to your point, I think that it would be reserved for cases that are much higher risk, okay. where you want to be having um, more resources used to ensure that um, uh, you know that that youth does not reoffend. Okay. And then my last sort of question of curiosity 
if we're talking about risky young adults, and you were talking about also domestic violence and um, sexual assault, sexual abuse, um, what about human trafficking, especially as it relates to um, labor, drug, and sex? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not seeing that. It, I'm not seeing that yeah. population or the work, the groups that I'm, I guess maybe I'm just highlighting it that no one needs to answer. Right. But I don't see that in any of this material. And right. my understanding is this is an increasing. It, this is something that we are noticing that is actually happening in Vermont. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think I think you raise a very good point. I think one of the sort of the advantages of, of incorporating 18 to 19 year old on your youth side and being the first state to do that is that you're going to then uh, you're you're bringing the resources and the expertise and adolescent development to that age group, and they're asking questions that the adult side they just don't ask. So I, I'll give an example: is you know. I, been to court many times where I've seen a, a 20 year old come in and they click in and say, Do you have an address? Yeah, they write down an address. Is do they really have an address? There's an address they can remember. But on the youth side, there's more questions about how long have you lived there? Who are you with? What you find with this age group is a huge amount of couch surfing. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not coming up as homeless, but in mm -hmm. effect, they're homeless. For young women in particular who are couch surfing, that puts them in a very vulnerable position where they feel they owe somebody something. And, um, and I think the more research we are doing on emerging adults, the more we realize that they were being underrepresented and underidentified um, for all the things that you just mentioned. Um, I, I, I think they would. Uh, hold, hold on, Judge Gerson. I'm looking at the oh. clock, and it's 10 Sorry. of and our, um, the person who's in the room needs to get on the road. Um, so I want to ask the people around the table if there's anything that they want to ask her. And then I want to highlight that we did have someone on the phone at 1.30, um, and we have someone then at quarter of 2. We're running legislative time, <laughs> but um, just to, um, to keep our comments and questions um, to the thing, but I want to say thank you and yeah, please no, give I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much, to, 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 to leave. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's been a great pleasure. It's a, it's a wonderful group. You have so many dedicated people in this state working on this issue. It's really so wonderful to see. And and I would just say it is. This is challenging, but I do think it's eminently doable. I think you are you are on the right track. Um, and so I'm really thrilled. Mm -hmm. okay. thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank um, you. Karen or Judge Grusin, do you have a one-minute comment that you want to make, or are we finished? So I think everything is good. <laughs> okay. From, from our yes, and, um, and I'm appreciating your questions. I'm also appreciating that this is a huge body of work for you guys to sit through in an yeah. hour and a half. <laughs> and, and so I did just want to share um, with you all that I'm happy to answer questions um, at least until December 13th. Um, and so feel free to send anything along to me if you think that there's something else that we need to consider, especially ahead of the next legislative session. Okay. Um, we, we would love your thoughts on that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody. Um, hello, uh, Dean, Th uh, Dean Thomas. Yes. Th uh, this is Representative Ann Pugh. How are you? Fine, thank you. Nice to hear your voice this morning. Um, thank you, and I apologize for our legislative time lateness um, and appreciate your being able to still communicate with us. Well, you bet. These things happen. I understand that. I do have a flight that I need to catch, and I'm going to need to leave here by uh, 15 after the hour. Okay. Um, then that, that's very helpful. Okay, um, we asked you to um, testify in terms of giving the Child Protection Oversight Committee, which is a joint committee of the House and Senate um, of six members, um, but to give an update on uh, the scope of work that UVM is going to be doing um, for us related to sort of discovering what's going on with the entrance of children in custody. 
Sure. Would you like me to just jump in? Yes, please. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you also very much for your interest in, in this very important project. Uh, as you know, I am Scott Thomas. I'm the Dean of the College of Education and Social Services at the University of Vermont. I am uh, in an interim capacity also serving as the Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at the University of Vermont. This project is an outgrowth of a series of convenings uh, to explore the drivers of Vermont's child custody rates over time. And uh, different groups have come together over the last year, uh, say eight months to, to a year, uh, to really try to understand the different dimensions that drive child custody rates in Vermont. And there, there is a perception, and uh, perception based in empirical fact, actually, that Vermont has an unusually high rate of custody um, relative to other states uh, across the U.S. The um, project was designed to focus on more than just what, you know, what are the one or two drivers that uh, are influencing these, these higher custody rates. Um, and we decided that the best way to examine this was to focus on uh, individuals, children, um, in the context of their environments and in the context of the policy domains in, in which uh, DCF and other service agencies operate. I'll talk a little bit about how we've arranged the study and organized it. Let me first uh, introduce the team. Um, I'm there, here with me. I'm going to just tell you who, who's on this team driving this. Uh, I am joined by uh, three very talented colleagues, uh, Professor Jessica Strolla, uh, a social worker. She is in our Department of Education at the University of Vermont in the College of Education and Social Services. Some of you might be familiar with Professor Strolla's work through the Child Welfare Training Partnership. And uh, one of her more recent uh, projects has been the Placement Stability Project, which is a trauma-informed adoption competent response to improving well-being for youth in foster care. She's very talented, uh, very uh, well-respected nationally, and brings a very unique set of skills uh, to the problems that we're addressing. Uh, second, we have Professor Tammy Colby, who uh, is a professor in our Educational Leadership and Policy Program. Uh, professor Colby is a uh, state policy expert uh, on social service policy and education policy. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Professor Colby's work uh, recently in the special education study that was uh, a prominent feature in the last legislative session, and uh, she's also involved in the school waiting study um, that will be uh, coming up uh, during this legislative session. Finally, we have uh, Dr. Hannah Holbrook, um, who is a recent uh, graduate from the University of Vermont Educational Psychology Doctoral Program. And Dr. Holbrook's dissertation, uh, I'll give you the short title, was Referral Patterns and Service Provision in Child Protective Services. She's one of the most talented uh, doctoral students and doctoral graduates that I have seen across my career. And her work speaks very powerfully to uh, to the problems that, that we've been charged with addressing through this study. My own background is rooted in sociology. Um, my work is focused uh, more on the, the research side of this. Um, my work focuses on modeling the effects of environmental context on individual behavior. Um, so for example, how does school climate affect teacher behavior and learning? How does family structure shape children's opportunities? Uh, or how do state policy environments shape individual well-being? These are the types of problems that, that I study from a modeling perspective to be able to say uh, how different factors relate to outcomes that we might be interested in. So the four of us are engaged in a phase study. And um, in the uh, uh, scope of work, we have three pieces in, in two phases. The first is a review of what we know from other research that's been conducted uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, the second is a case study of students where we had proposed following individual cases to examine uh, the different points of contact that these children have had with different service agencies um, and let's say healthcare education, uh, these types of things that might inform an uh, in, in assessment of um, a, a child's uh, condition at any given point in time. The third uh, component in this phase study is a longitudinal analysis where we have proposed to go back 20 years or so 
and look at uh, the actual records of uh, cases that have come through and try to capture why there's variance in uh, custody intake across time. Uh, what are some of the factors that are driving intake decisions? Uh, is there recidivism in intake, repeat occurrences? Um, recidivism is absolutely the wrong word there. I apologize for using that. It came from a different context, different context entirely. Um, and uh, really putting those those decisions, those custody decisions in the context of families, in the context of communities, in the context of other service provisions, and in the context of policy changes that have occurred over time to try to understand um, uh, what might be driving the variance in, uh, in custody decisions uh, across that time period. So those are the three phases. Um, let me stop there for a moment. I want to go into those three phases a little bit more to talk with you about uh, how we've conceptualized four areas that, that are going to be important to us. But I want to stop and see if there are any questions. I, I, I'm a body language reader, and obviously I'm, I'm seeing no body language here. It's all good. It's, it's all good, and um, um, I'm sort of a taskmaster. I've already told okay. you um, that we now only have 15 minutes before you lose your plane. So go okay. ahead. All right, uh, so let's go with uh, how we're, how we're what, what we call in academia, framing the problem. Uh, you know, how are, what are the things we think are important for, for a, a thorough understanding of this problem? And if you look, if you kind of envision a circle in your, in your mind and you draw a line down the middle of it and line across it, you can come up with four quadrants, pretty easy. Uh, so in that top left quadrant in your mind's eye, uh, think about uh, a label that might say community factors. What are the community factors that might inform uh, or, or might affect the probability of uh, child custody rates in any given town or any given district or any given region of the state? Move over to the top right quadrant and think about what the individual factors might be. Uh, race, substance abuse, in the family, the age of the child, the type of abuse, SDM risk scores, those types of things. So those would be individual factors. If you're going clockwise now, move down to the bottom right quadrant. Uh, there could be other factors like uh, interprofessional collaboration that's going on in different periods of time. There could be legal considerations that we might not that we might want to account for. Uh, there could be uh, fluctuations in workforce characteristics. Uh, uh, worker caseload sizes, media pressures, there could be high profile cases that bring attention to uh, to the environment that shape the way decisions are made. So those would be other factors in that bottom right quadrant. Move all the way around now to the bottom left quadrant and there are policy factors. So um, there are statutes, <coughs> policies, uh, legislative changes uh, that occur that influence the decision making frameworks for people who are uh, you know, really evaluating and making decisions about a, ch a child's status at any given point in time. So those four factors, again, community factors, individual case factors, these other factors about the environment, and then policy factors are four areas in which we're organizing our work. And we have a whole series of questions in, in each one of those, those areas. That's what we'll do is we're examining the um, the literature and, and the work that's been done over the last 10, 15 years, 20 years perhaps, uh, and that's what we'll be doing is we're examining the existing data within the state of Vermont to really get at this empirically. So the data pieces are um, what are going to present a challenge for us at some level. Uh, data are going to be drawn from uh, what others have done across the country over time. That one's fairly easy because that's in the public domain. Um, data will also be drawn from DCF, uh, and then we're going to supplement those data from uh, some other agencies where that's possible. That sounds like a great study plan, maybe. Some of you may have a difference of opinion, of opinion and you'll share that with me, perhaps. Um, but the, the challenge is in actually getting those data in a timely way and ensuring that the data are actually of the quality that will allow for the best study that we can conduct. Now, the latter part's out of our control, like the quality of the data. We need to get in and actually have a look at that. Um, DCF and UVM uh, have an existing data sharing agreement uh, as part of Professor Strollen's uh, placement stability project. 
And in that agreement, uh, DCF and UBM have contracted with a third party called Vertical Change. And this third party effectively takes data from DCF and anonymizes it uh, and then passes it along to UVM. So they're, they're, they're a broker, it's kind of a, a blind third party to this arrangement that ensures that the privacy of the records is protected. Now, we were hoping that we would be able to use that as a starting point um, to just add additional data that we need to conduct the study that I've been describing to you over the last 10 minutes. Um, it looks like, it, as uh, DCF has, has looked at this, and the um, uh, federal state, state agreement folks have taken a look at this, that it will probably be easier to actually come up with a new data sharing contract. But in either event, these things take a, a fair amount of time. And right now, it's looking like the, the earliest we're going to have these data, according to the last uh, round of emails that I saw, would be March. So that puts us in a jam in terms of being able to address uh, the components where we really need the uh, Vermont specific data and it's going to back us up further into the spring into the legislative session at that point. Now we're still working on uh, the exact timeline, but I've already got a yellow flag planted right there that that might hold us up on some pieces of this. There's still a lot of things that that we can be doing to help inform the legislature uh, early in the session. Um, but you've asked for an update, and I'm telling you that I'm seeing a little yellow flag waving right here uh, about our access to some of these data in a timely way. And our partners at DCF have been fantastic. This is not anyone dragging their feet. Uh, this is the web of um, regulation uh, that's guiding the sharing of this type of very sensitive information, and these are important and valid regulations that uh, preserve the, the privacy and protect the individual. So uh, we're, we're aware of all that, but I do want to stress that this is not an agency uh, at all holding us up. This is uh, the reality of us having to navigate the regulatory environment. So uh, let me stop right there and I'm happy to uh, talk with you about um, your ideas or, or concerns and in, in respond to the best of my ability. I'm looking to see if there are any questions or comments. Um, Dean Thomas, I guess two questions. One, does it make a difference if, I mean, you say um, the, the recommendation or the feedback is that you need a, a new data sharing contract. Um, so the old one doesn't work at all? No, the old one does work. The old one will be renewed, but the belief is that that renewal will be more onerous and time consuming than creating a new data sharing agreement around this project without the restrictions of that other data sharing agreement. Okay. Because that was for a different purpose. Okay. Um, in the, um, thank you. In the um, appropriations bill that was passed that, um, source the money to um, UVM. Uh, it says there'll be um, some sort of report by um, January 30th. Now clearly that's Correct. not going to happen. Um, um, and you, you know, you're not alone. Um, I've just um, signed about three different, okayed about three different things from state agencies saying we need some more time. Um, but my question is, do you think, um, to you and maybe to the committee, does it make sense for any kind of um, report versus a email that says we need more time on January 30th? Um, Representative Pugh, I, I would um, uh, affirm that we will have a report to the legislature okay. by January 30th. Okay. On, on, on some piece of that first phase. Okay. Well, We're certainly. Okay. We'll certainly have, have a, a, a substantial set of information to report at, at, at that point. Okay. It's the second part that may take a little bit longer. No, that's fine. And I, just, I wanted to see whether folks thought that was feasible or whether, and I appreciate that. I think it will be helpful, helpful to us, um, helpful to the various parties who were interested and in, to want to ensure that this money was in place to help us frame our future directions. 
Um, I see that you have exactly five minutes before you can catch your plane, um, according to our clock. Are there other <laughs> questions? No, I think the timing question will probably become more apparent um, with your January 30th report. So okay. I, I, I don't have anything further at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dean. And this was very, um, Dean Thomas, this was very helpful in outlining and especially setting um, clear the framing of the problem. And it's exciting that three people that you have, um, oh, including yourself, the three people that you have um, involved in this project. Well, thank you all for your, your interest and support, and I look forward to working with, with you and others who are committed to uh, understanding these problems and finding viable resolutions. So let's go forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. We are totally changing populations, and I mean, you know, we're still talking about people. Um, um, but uh, the um, Reach Up Case Management Review and Community Engagement Report was um, to come to us as well as other year old houses. And um, I'm learning about passing papers. <laughs> Okay. So I thought I would just kind of go through some of the main points of the report. And as you know, this was requested. Oh, um, Aaron. Oh, my name. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Erin Olikin, and I am the director of the Reach Out program. Um, so thanks for having me uh, today. I'm here to talk to you about the Reach Up Case Management and Community Engagement Report that was requested that we submit to, um, to your committee. So I wanted to start with the vision and the mission of the Reach Up Program. This is a vision and mission that we've developed over the last couple of years to really reflect where we hope to be and where we are right now. So our vision is that families will be empowered, connected, and thriving. And our mission, the work that we do here and now every day, is that Reach Up joins families on their journey to overcome obstacles, explore opportunities, improve their finances, and reach their goals. And it's really important to us that the word families is in there, and that was very deliberate because we do work with families. Um, and the, the, needs and, um, the needs of the entire family are really carefully considered um, and we look to the well-being of the children and the parents or caregivers as really inextricably tied. So I'll just kind of go through an outline of what I'm going to talk about today in the different areas of this report. The first is um, I'll outline the current components of the family development plan, and that's the plan that every adult who's receiving Reach Up puts together to plan uh, for their goals and to eventually um, attain employment. The second is um, to identify what modifications may be required to make sure that there is a comprehensive assessment of the family's strengths and needs, um, and so that the family development plan addresses those strengths and needs in the care of the children. The third is I'm going to review how families um, who are at risk of involvement in the Child Welfare System or Family Services Division, um, how we identify those families and how we work um, to prevent involvement if at all possible and then continue to work with Family Services Division if um, Family Services does take custody of those children. And then it to, the fourth is to examine current practices of serving Reach Up families. And some of these practices include home visiting um, and numerous referrals and engagement with community partners and on community teams, various community teams. Um, and that's um, to ensure and enhance um, parental care and family stability. So the first part is the family development plan. This is something that is statutorily required that every adult, either parent or caregiver, has a family development plan. And this is a plan um, that outlines employment and other goals and um, the steps that are necessary to achieve those goals. 
it's developed by the participant, so it's really a participant-driven uh, process, and then the, the case manager is there to help and support and guide that process, and to use, use what we know in science and evidence um, to help people to be motivated and to reach their goals. So there are five main components in the FDP, we call it the FDP for short. One is the employment goal. The second is the responsibilities and the required activities that both the case manager and the participant have. So it's really a legal document, it's something that both parties agree to. Third is the number of hours that the participant is going to take part in any activities. The fourth is the participants and the family strengths and in er any areas where they may need additional support. And finally, um, we identify resources such as support services, so that may be additional help that, that the program can offer the family to help them uh, meet their goals. So it's really a living document. It frequently changes. Um, and. It also contains elements of or references to other plans that the family may have. So families often have plans with Family Services Division, with Head Start, um, with the Vermont State Housing Family Self-Sufficiency Program, yes. Children's Integrated Services, and we really try to incorporate those things um, in the plan or to at least reference them so that it's acknowledged that the family is often working on many different things with many different service providers. And we don't want to duplicate efforts. We do want to support them and offer them whatever kind of help they need to meet their goals in other areas as well. Um, and it really does reflect a holistic approach to family well-being because it does address the needs of both parents and children. So sometimes uh, a family development plan will have um, things on there that are specifically related to the children. So it could be that the uh, family is working with uh, Children's Integrated Services or with Early Head Start is just a couple of examples. So in Section 2, um, any modifications that may be required to the program, I did want to start with what we are doing well and what we do right now to address uh, the nurturing and care of children because um, the program really does quite a lot. Um, in October 2017, our in independent contractor, uh, Leslie Black Plumo and Rob McIntyre, produced a report for us that examined the indicators of child well-being. They looked at a cohort of families who began receiving reach up in 2013 and 2014, and um, those families had stayed on reach up for at least 24 months, which um, incidentally is typically uh, about the average amount of time that families do stay on reach up uh, cumulatively throughout a lifetime. So in this case, um, these were families that stayed on for 24 months. And what they found was that the families who had participated in the Reach Up program um, showed marked improvement in things like housing stability, access to high quality child care, early, early education, mental health and substance use of the parents and the families, um, and parenting skills two years later. And so all of these things, you know, as we know, the the importance of housing stability for the healthy brain development of children um, and um, the mental health and um, of the parents is critical for um, children's health and well-being and so and of course access to high quality care um, is has predictors for their fu for children's future success um, and this is all all based on research, and so it was very encouraging to see that ReachUp has had such positive outcomes on um, families with, with children, young children. Um, so ReachUp case managers use a strength-based coaching model of case management. Um, so it's really focused on building a mutually trusting and respectful relationship. We recently transitioned to a new assessment process, and the tool that we're using now is called Stepping Stones. In the past, we used the self-sufficiency outcomes matrix, and this new tool um, asks about uh, family and child well-being. It's, this whole process has been guided uh, by nationally renowned experts from Mathematica Policy Research and uh, Dr. LaDonna Pavetti, who's been an expert in um, TANF policy and change 
uh, for the last 20 years, and she's from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. So we've been really fortunate to work with um, these nationally renowned experts in helping us transition the program um, and continue to work in evidence-based ways and, and using research and science as our basis for what truly works. And so this coaching model is a science-based approach to helping participants achieve their goals. So one of the things, so you might ask, what, is, what does goal achievement have to do with children's well-being? Well, one of the interesting things about setting and achieving goals is that it strengthens critical core capabilities. And this has been very well researched by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, that when adults develop these core capabilities, that they're more able to effectively parent their children and have responsive relationships with their children. And so additionally, the case managers and um, participants are modeling those responsive relationships of give and take and trusting relationships that are necessary within a family. Um, and so it really builds those responsive relationships, not only between the participant and the, and the um, case manager, but also within the families who are working, um, who are participating in the Reach Out program. So one example I just wanted to give of um, somebody who found some success with this new goal-oriented approach, and this is a shift from the previous, um, previously it was very regulation-driven, and pretty much somebody came in and a case manager would say, here are the requirements, this is what you must do, um, you know, and kind of would outline it for someone. So in this particular example, there was a young man who had wanted to do um, something in, I believe it was the music industry. And in the past, what we probably would have said was, well, that doesn't fit into the requirements of the program, and so you can't do that, but you could do this unpaid work experience. Um, this time, what we did with this new approach is the case manager talked to him using motivational interviewing, asking him, well, what is it that you're really drawn to in this? And said, okay, if that's what you want to do, let's figure out how to do it. So what happened was fascinating. He spent the next week or so researching everything that needed to be done in order to reach his goal, his you know kind of dream job, and realized he really needed to get a job in the meantime. And within about two or three months, he had a very well-paid job, well-paying job, and has stayed off of reach up and, and had be, through setting those goals on his own and discovering that on his own, this was somebody who had been reach up, on reach up for multiple years. And so it's really fascinating to see the shift when we you know, give people the dignity and the structure around helping people to identify what are their goals and how do we strengthen those skills needed to achieve our goals, that, that it can happen. Um, so that was just one example that I wanted to share with you, but we have many, many more that I'd be happy to come back at some point. I'm sure I will at some point somewhere to share with you. Um, but some of the other I, um, activities that may be found on the FDP, the Family Development Plan, are things like working with um, Children's Integrated Services, working with Head Start, attending therapy appointments, working with Family Services, attending parenting classes, housing search, child care search. Uh, so all of these things really support, and again, just the, the parent or caregiver and the child being so inextricably tied that the well-being of one is going to affect the well-being of the other. And I think our case managers really understand that in all of our training, we kind of reinforce that. Um, so um, some improvements that we, we know that we can make and that we're working on right now. One of the things that we're doing, um, and this is an ongoing process, is assessing the program through a trauma-informed lens. So we have, um, we are receiving peer, uh, peer support through the Administration for Children and Families um, and have been working with um, a trauma expert from Rutgers University to assess the program and to make changes to the program as we go along, incremental changes to become more and more trauma-informed. Um, and we, do, we estimate that probably at least 90% of the families we work with have experienced trauma in their lifetime. 
So it really is important to understand that in order to help people be successful. And we're also working really closely with Auburn Watersong, who, whom you may already have met, um, who is a, the AHS Director of Resiliency Development and Trauma Prevention. So she's working closely with us as, as well to make sure that we are really coordinating with other trauma efforts in the state. Um, we're also increasing home visiting when it's appropriate and desired by the family. Uh, so that has been, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, and we are continuing to work in collaboration with Head Start and Family Services, CIS, and Parent Child Centers. So that is always something that we can improve upon and continue to build on those collaborations um, to work together. And the third area that I'm going to talk about is child welfare and reach ups role in prevention. So reach up uh, families, as I mentioned, they develop really those trusting and responsive relationships with the participants they're working with. And so they're often the first to hear about struggles within that family. So the, they either, uh, the participant may share that with them, and that in the combination with going, with going into the home, when um, a participant invites them into their home, is a really effective way um, to be able to prevent um, children from going into custody because they can work with them on the front end. Um, the other thing is just having some basic needs met through the Reach Out program is just a critical component to preventing um, children entering into um, the, welfare, the child welfare system. Um, case managers also regularly coordinate team meetings with family services and with other services that the families are involved in. So they, they are often kind of the main coordinator of those meetings and um, will very regularly have teaming meetings, child protection meetings, and the reach up case manager will be um, there with to support the, the family in those meetings. Um, Case managers are also participating in ongoing professional development to increase their skills. And that's something that when I came on board as the director about four years ago, um, has been really important um, to me and to our team as we move forward is to ensure that, that people have the training that they need to be able to do their jobs well, um, feel confident in their jobs. So our, our latest training was our, our day-long professional development day. And the theme of that was working with families with complex needs. And so some of the topics for that day included mental health, trauma and resiliency, child and maternal health, employment for adults with mental health needs, and domestic violence. And uh, additionally, um, the Reach Up team and Family Services Division staff work together to coordinate services when a child is in custody. And so we've, um, each of the districts has local teams that, that work together to identify those families and to make sure they're surrounded with the support that they need. And, fam and finally, um, current practices that we use to support family stability and healthy parenting, we've already heard some of them. There's some, certainly some overlap between these areas. Um, but, um, but we really uh, you know, recognize that in order for families to thrive and improve their finances, which is part of our mission, all members of the family need to be healthy and safe. Um, and again, that goes back to our mission and vision is that family is in that mission and vision. It is about the family. Um, so recently we put a protocol in place to offer home visits to every family when it's safe and appropriate. And um, in, back in 2017, we recognized the need to provide training to reach up case managers in order for them to have the skills and the confidence they needed to go into homes. Um, they were already doing home visiting at that point, but we really recognized that they needed some more training in that area. So we started then, and since then, there have been multiple trainings to address safety needs um, <clears throat> and kind of home visiting uh, best practices or providing services in the home. Um, so we started then in July to track um, the number to really be mindful of tracking how many home visits are happening so we can get a good <coughs> idea of, of what's happening on the ground. Um, and in July of 2019, 31% of face-to-face -face appointments were home visits. So by September, so just a couple months later, that had increased to 34%. So it's been gradually going up. 
and um, when families are not being met in their homes, they're either being met in the office um, at ESD or at a in community outposting area. And so we do have case managers who outpost in some of the more rural areas especially so that they can provide a little more efficient service and serve people um, in those areas. Uh, so they're outposting uh, currently at North, some examples are at um, NECA, Northeast Kingdom Community Action, the Orange County Parent Child Center, the Family Place um, Parent Child Center in Norwich, Parks Place and Bellows Falls and Notch Par Partnering Project in Richford. So those are all areas where they're in the community. Um, and then I also just wanted to share when um, they're not, when meetings are not happening, or when they are happening in the office um, versus in the home, that some of the reasons that people cite for that are um, just plain preference because we ask them and um, we won't co go into their home if they don't want us there. Um, and also just um, it may be the very first meeting be between the case manager and the participant. Um, th sometimes they drop in because they're there for other reasons, so they just dropped in and so they're obviously already at the office. Um, if a family is homeless, they may not have a home to visit in. Um, and then one of the biggest reasons is that they're accessing other resources wherever it is that they happen to be. So they might be going to Department of Labor or visiting with an employment specialist or WIC, and so they're already in the area, so it makes sense for them to combine appointments. Um, and then another piece is that connections with community partners is really a critical piece in supporting families. So we are connected um, with multiple community partners, de designated agencies that provide mental health services, preferred providers that provide um, substance use disorder treatment, um, voc rehab, uh, family services, CIS, parent-child centers, um, you know, it, it, the, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, our case managers locally and our local reach-up teams are very well connected in their communities and um, often sit on many of the kind of teams that are happening in the air in that local area to support families. So some examples of that are um, Comstat or Kidstat, Charm, um, Child Protection Teams, some of the housing review teams and Continuum of Care. So really um, whatever they can do to support the families is, is where they are in the community. And I did want to note also that in 2017 uh, Mathematical Policy Research did an independent evaluation or assessment of the reach of program and one of the things that they noted was that teaming and service coordination occur frequently between reach up program staff and community partners. Reach up program staff and community partners reported regular teaming arrangements within and across agency to coordinate services for clients. We found, this is Mathematica speaking, a strong commitment to holding regular service coordination meetings involving the parent and a full array of community partners, including child welfare staff. So Reach Up Program really is well poised to coordinate with community partners and address the needs of both parents and children. We're always looking for ways to do things better um, through training, through building more, more partnerships and more collaborations, um, and are, are really committed to continuous quality improvement. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, questions. Is this what folks wanted in terms of what was in the appropriations bill in terms of a report? I mean, it covers, but I'm looking to our member of the appropriations committee if you remember that if there was anything in particular in addition. No, I um, I, I think. Um, it, it's a good overview of what they did. I think, you know, with the drop off in numbers, it, that was um, a piece of yep. um, the why that's happening is um, is a piece that I'm not sure um, that this gets at what the population looks like. Right. And what I actually just pulled, 
I did not, excuse me, a little help from my friends. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> don't have that ability. But, um, but I, I, I think... Know, I mean, and, and we didn't really ask right. that. Right, right. But that would, it was, I think, quick it, it um, you know, as, as we did it at the end, mm -hmm. but I think the piece of what the population looks like, not exactly what sure. we're doing, is a piece of what um, was contemplated right. in that. Right. Um. So are you looking for... There's been a significant drop-off in population. Mm -hmm. We're in, um, in the nature of what the population looks like mm -hmm. is very different than what it was right. even just a few years ago. Right. So in um, serving that population and figuring out what we're doing, mm -hmm. it isn't just about what um, structurally it looks like, mm -hmm. it's what do they look like. Now. Yeah. And so I think mm -hmm. that was a piece of what we were interested in. Well, I'm happy to talk about that if if you'd like to hear a little bit about that. I don't have all my statistics in You're front right. of me, I but mean, I can tell in you know I can talk in kind of general terms mm -hmm. about, um, in particular, how it it has the demographic has shifted in the last five years or so. And uh, and I, I'm happy to have you talk about that. I, I will say for me, it would be better if it was down in a, right. a, a form where I can look at it, um, digest it, and, uh, and ask questions. Right. It's, it's hard without having it have been in the in a bill itself, but... but right, we didn't ask for it. Yeah, I know. Right, I understand. But that was a piece it. of what was in the back yeah. of it. Yeah. So, so um, fair warning? between now and <laughs> right. January. Um, now that you've given this, we're like, oh, this is good. Now we want more. Please, yes, yeah. ma'am, we'd like some more. Okay. Um, so I think some of that um, might be <coughs> that. I think um, yeah. we might have um, some add-ons to that, too. Mm -hmm. but, well, we could, we, could, we could ask for the change in demographic. I think that's a really good place to begin. Mm -hmm. if, that's, if that's easily uh, put into some format that we could look at. It doesn't need to be a formal report, mm -hmm. but a presentation that we could have mm -hmm. in our committees, yeah. that would be really helpful. Yeah, I can definitely do that. I mean, what, I mean, some of the things that we see, which I'm sure is no surprise, is an increase in some of the uh, mental health mm -hmm. barriers and mm -hmm. substance use disorder. Some of that is very hard to track because it is self-reported and we don't have a system that's good for collecting that data. Um, in five years. In five years, and yeah. Usually we say <laughs> three years. <laughs> well, yeah, but but, but in, 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 in next year it's three years and then the next year it's three years. Right. But um, that is also a trend that nationally, that TANF programs are seeing nationally, is that the, the folks who are left on TANF, pretty much everyone who can get a job easily has gotten a job. Yep. And so we, of course, still have people who come in and are on reach for a month or two, and then they're off and, they, and they're employed. And the folks who are remaining do tend to have much greater needs. Um, homelessness, you know, I, I mean, you know what all those needs are, I'm sure. Um, so Can you do yeah, that by category great. for us, uh, so, mm -hmm. so we know, because yeah. that'll inform where we need to put other energies. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Good. So interestingly, like some of the areas that are are very nuanced, which is why I would love to kind of be able to explain some of yeah. of that better. Um, like for example, homelessness data. We have. Um, folks who are, uh, I heard one of the previous speakers talking about couch surfing. So no one can afford housing on a reach of grant unless you have subsidized housing. And even then it's a stretch. And so, um, so families are doubling up or they're sharing space with, and all of that, you know, as we know, is, is incredibly difficult. It's very damaging to children in those families mm -hmm. to be so insecure in their housing. Um, so, yeah. This came on. Well, sorry. No, no, no. This came on the backside of the increase um, because it's been so long, right. and we are still so far behind. Mm -hmm. So a piece of 
this mm -hmm. came out of that mm -hmm. and then concern about the population. And it was all done at the end of right. the process. So it was, but that's where the concerns were. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, so what would be helpful, I think, uh, for us is to know when you might have some of that information in a form that can be presented to our committees. Can, it, can that be like a PowerPoint? Yeah, or that's what I'm thinking yes. about. A simple mm -hmm. PowerPoint. Uh, so uh, I'm out the first two weeks of you know, December. This is but January. No, we're oh, January. January. Okay. <laughs> this is our last meeting. This is oh, okay. our last gotcha. meeting. Yeah, um, anytime January or after, I certainly could. Okay. But I mean, yeah. uh, my problem is right now I don't have an administrative assistant to say, remind, you know, please contact so and so. <laughs> so if you could send an email along. You, you Peggy will keep it. Uh, Peggy will keep send it to me. I'll, I'll yeah, that's good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I thought generally we were all overstaffed. Oh, we are. <laughs> um, <laughs> and overpaid. Overpaid. <laughs> 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 um, a question. I, I was very heartened by um, this transition from a regulation driven mm -hmm. approach. And I'm curious where you think you are at as mm -hmm. far as all of your family service workers in that kind of full transition like wh where are you at like are you in the early stages of that I know that there are um, family service workers who have been with you for years and years I mean and that's not an easy it's almost like a culture shift that's exactly it. and I'm just curious you know is do you feel um, positive about that where do you think you're at um, and I think the approach the team approach I think that's a, a really worthwhile thing to help that happen mm -hmm. Yeah, such a great question. Um, so it kind of depends on the case manager. You know, like any culture change, some people are on board right away and others are kind of, well, I'll wait and see. And then there are others who are kind of like, no, this is not the way. But I would say for the most part, we are on our way, but we still have work to do. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a matter of constantly reiterating, you know, why we're doing this and the science behind it, and that it really truly does work if we do it the right way, mm -hmm. and that we assume the best about people and that people have the best intentions and want the best for themselves and their families. And if we do that and we work, you know, with intrinsic motivation and all that we know about responsive relationships, that we'll get there. And so I think the more you know, the more we talk about it, the more training we do, the closer we're getting. I would say we're somewhere between uh, kind of like, in, uh, probably like intermediate to advanced intermediate right now. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> so yeah, we're getting there. It's very exciting. I will say that we had a, we recently hired a case manager who had been a reach of case manager a number of years ago went to do something else and then when there was an opening in that district she decided to come back and she was hired on again and um, she said on a training phone call that we had on the goal oriented approach she said I have to say that I love this new reach up and she said I feel like it's actually working you know it's actually doing what we want to do with families and that families are finding it to be um, so respectful and you know families say nobody really has ever asked me that mm -hmm. and when you hear things like that you think about oh my you know how how um how much families have been told what to do in mm -hmm. so many different realms and so many different services that they've received and to be the simple question of being asked, what do you want to do what's meaningful to you? Mm -hmm. How far you can get with that question mm -hmm. is pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. It's exciting, very exciting. Good work. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Um, and as you're coming back at some point in time, because we love hearing this kind of stuff, um, Mary Beth just talked about how this shift to um, in practice, and you said, is working. Mm -hmm. My question will be, even though I like to get into the weeds, mm -hmm. what um, trying not to get into the weeds, is anything statutorily 
preventing you from doing that? Great question. And if there is, then whether we'll change it or not, I don't know, but <laughs> let us know. I'll be happy to let you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Really appreciate it. So we have a little bit of time for committee um, updates because some folks have been engaged in other kinds of activities um, related to this work. And as Aaron's walking out the door, I'm just going to say I'm part of the two-generation um, group, which is community, uh, someone from the community, a, a participant, the whole nine yards, and um, really trying to focus on doing work differently and connecting with folks. And um, I'm actually going to a meeting next week. Um, I missed one yesterday that was in Vermont, but going to another meeting in Rhode Island for a day. Um, this is um, spearheaded by NCSL and the um, federal, whoever they are, Department of Children and Families kind of thing in terms of underwriting it and trying to get the community involved. There's, in theory, from some of the other states, there is a philanthrop philanthropist involved to try to, you know, so trying to sort of get the whole community involved around um, supporting families and ensuring that families um, aren't in poverty. And that really is what Reach Up is all about. These are families you are in deep poverty. <laughs> so, me next. Yes. <laughs> um, I talked about this a little bit the last time we met. Mm -hmm. um, after spending two days in, in Ohio talking about the foster care system, um, we were supposed to come back with a few action steps, and I couldn't remember all of them the last time. Um, but the first has to do with um, the fact that, and I know this is. It's like a broken record thing that the IT system um, is just old and outdated and maybe a five-year joke isn't going to be acceptable for too much longer. Um, and what struck me about hearing about the research that's going to be done is that there's a chance that they may not be able to get the information that they're going to need to evaluate the system. Um, and, and that's pretty telling. Um, so maybe it's time to have a serious discussion about about that. Um, the uh, second thing was hearing um, about the um, foster care advisory board, and it seems that Vermont has something akin to that. And I don't. Maybe Amy can remind me what it's actually called, but. I don't remember. Um, it doesn't have an official name anymore. It was formed out of the Foster Care Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. and you had statutorily asked us to form a committee with court, DCF, and foster parents. And we met for a year and presented back, and then we've just continued to meet ever since. So it's a work group that meets quarterly, and then there's subgroups that meet monthly from that. Um, so given that it seems like it's sort of an informal thing, um, maybe looking to, to formalize that and um, that came out of some discussion from foster families that said that um, having that kind of voice they found to be really, really helpful um, for themselves and for the system at large. Um, and along with that went a sense of having some peer support built into the system in, in a more formal way. And what I've heard from some people who are involved in, in foster care is that they tend to do that in a more informal fashion and they kind of support each other, but um, it's not kind of baked in and it might be something um, could be helpful all around and maybe be done in conjunction with the advisory board. I, maybe not. Um, and then my, my fourth, well, they were sort of fourth and fifth thoughts um, <laughs> was <laughs> looking at co-parenting between foster families and birth families and when appropriate and able um, asking them if they are can um, participate together 
in forming um, goals towards reunification with birth families um, and and maybe trying to knock down some of the um, whether they're perceived or actual but like adversarial situations between foster and, and birth families and making birth families feel like they're not um, yeah mm -hmm. so, thank you um, and again if that's an actual part of the, the, a spoken goal and not just left to being an informal thing. Potentially helpful, not in all cases, it's clearly not something that can happen in all cases, but. Um, and then a fourth little thing that came up is that if the goal is reunification and but you're also hoping to provide permanency for a child, um, if you're dealing with a family that has a substance use disorder of any kind, um, as we know, that treatment and recovery are um, a continuum and an ongoing process, and are there sort of artificial barriers to reunification? Um, because there can be a lot of stop and start, um, and, and maybe how to work into the system um, different timelines where that's a factor. Um, yeah, and and peers, right, and that you know, like <coughs> sort of larger than just the. <laughs> I, so Kelly, uh, this looks a lot of this looks really um, good. I know that we've talked about some of this in the past, but um, it gets to be more and more important going <laughs> forward. Are you thinking about putting um, a, a bill in? Um, I legislation in to begin the conversation? I would certainly be willing to. There are the other thing that came along with my little hand scratch yeah. list is some examples from some other states that are doing um, similar things or have done similar things. So there's mm -hmm. some, some good jumping off places. And so I don't know if you want to pick in, or if I want to, if, if in discussion with you or, or all of us or whatever, um, pick and choose one or two things. I know that the IT system is a much bigger. I'd say the lower the fiscal <laughs> note, the better off well, we are. That is very <laughs> true. Um, but I don't, you know. Yeah. Yes, I'm. Yeah, I'm completely you willing do that. to do that. I think that. you should. I mean, you've you've done a lot of work. It's up to your chair, though, whether. It well, whether it goes anywhere. But I'll I'll, I'll yeah. also <laughs> put in a plug for the you know the Office of Child Advocate mm. Bill that's hanging on our wall, which okay. the, the, which we have heard about okay. um, is something that came up at this conference as well um, and I had some discussions with the representative from Maine and New Hampshire about their programs and something that we talked about so you know and then after listening to the report earlier mm -hmm. um, becomes more and more apparent that that conversation has to happen well and there's yeah. I mean that there's a part of me just even hearing some of what what was said and just as we're beginning to refocus on mm -hmm. foster care. What I just came to realize, and I'm embarrassed because it is out of my other life, uh -oh. parts of <laughs> my other life. Um, in terms of training, in terms of training of um, uh, family service workers, mm -hmm. in terms of recruiting and let's say um, supporting foster parent retention, mm -hmm. that's through the Child Welfare Partnership. Okay. That is not through, um, I mean, it's through a contract with DCA, yeah. but yeah. I mean, that that is not done by, um, and so it's like, it probably is, and they've done some research and they're also doing things, yeah. and we probably should hear mm -hmm. what they're doing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what they're, I mean, some of this has been, um, Dean Thomas talked about, uh, um, Dr. Stolen, Professor um, mm -hmm. um, Stolen, and her work. Mm -hmm. um, which was um, funded through a federal grant, and so um, what is the outcome of it, and is this one of another example of a fabulous fe federal thing that's yeah. now disappeared, or is it does ongoing? It money doesn't and right. so, I mean, there's a part of me that thinks that along with everything else, along with seniors, along with everything, but yes. is, we need to focus. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think mm -hmm. the, um, I'm going to blame it all on you and the um, Senate appropriations. You sort of put some um, things in the budget that I think to highlight areas that maybe we need to look at more. 
closely, one of which was, re, you know, reach mm -hmm. up and, and the other is um, our child custody and how do we support um, families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. But, but the child advocate, I know that there will be, the, the money uh, issue right. is always a problem, but defining that as something that fits Vermont and may not be right. the full-blown everything um, mm -hmm. might help move us along. Mm -hmm. Agree. Yeah. yeah. It's in your hands. <laughs> oh. Wait a second. <laughs> okay, well, I guess there is energy in our committee, though, to look. You know, that's the sense I get. Right, but you don't want. You, yeah. you, know, you don't want to have the energy bubbling over, and then you don't want to stop it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need to be collaborative. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I am. Yeah. I am. No, no, no. We'll be happy to look at something. I, you know, it's, okay. it, but. It, again, it's it's money. It's it's all mm -hmm. about you know. Yes. Do you want what, not, Senator? You know, <laughs> oh. um, can so, is there any? Yeah, I do have one other thing. Okay, good. Right. It's a little thing. It's a small thing. There was it was a great program uh, last evening in Winooski, um, a, a film that was brought to us by Let's Grow Kids, mm -hmm. and it was really I felt a celebration of all the work that we have done with. Early child care. At last last session, we did a huge amount of work, but the movie itself is very compelling. It's about an hour long, maybe a little bit longer. And I and I really think it'd be great to expose our colleagues to the film. Mm -hmm. So I'm just throwing it out on well, the table. What's the film? It's called A Small, Small Thing, Small. and it's about uh, childhood development. It goes every it, it goes through the whole system. Mm -hmm of child care and early child care. So uh, from brain development uh, to families in need and everything that we know and have talked about. But I thought it would be, uh, well, it, I have talked, who did I talk with? Maida was there last night, Maida mm -hmm. Townsend. She's interested. I mean, there but is, you know, I mean, and I've talked to another chair. This whole concept about brain development um, is, of interest to a lot of people, and then as we're talking about adolescence is longer than it used to be. It's all uh, part of it. Um, and I'm sitting there going, what does that mean for things that we've done that say at 21 you can do them? Do we need to anyway? Um, I wonder if you know how we how we share that information and do it in a way that people can, if they want to. This one is more about early child okay. development. So the first three to five years of life, mm -hmm. and uh, but also about the system of care or early care that exists or doesn't exist. It's a pretty generic film, even though it wasn't made in and about Vermont, but it does relate very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, we'll, so I mean, we'll that up. yeah, we'll work together. Senator Westman, do you have anything? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. You covered it. You covered it. So thank you all. Um, I think that um, we met whatever four or five times, four times, and um, we got a lot. I think you know we have um, heard and we you know got a jump start on things that we want to pursue. Um, and um, what I would uh, suggest to those to you and um, Dick isn't here, but um, and Richie as to how it makes sense if you want Bryn or um, me or you right, to come to your respective committees to give an update because you know if you think mm -hmm. it, as it is appropriate in terms right. of what sure. we yeah. did um, mm -hmm. I think it's really clear today's early first report um, we'll start with um, with judiciary and for mm -hmm. um, appropriations we'll mm -hmm. clearly have a Role in that, but what is the role of healthcare, health and welfare, right. and human yeah. services? We'll need to see um, whether yeah. just to pay attention. Well, right. I do think that the first report is really important to go both of our committees. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. we have to do it. Okay, as that bill develops in judiciary, okay, and or appropriations. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank you. Good work. Yeah. Good work, Representative Hugh. Thank you yes. for your work on this.
closed. And we're three o'clock.